Here this conference will now be recorded. Hello. Okay. Are you able to hear? Okay. So here a filter is used. Okay. Uh, the filter uh, can be single stage filter. Dual, double stage filters can be used. Uh, a yeah, yeah, simple filter on a fine ultra filtration uh, techniques also can be used. Okay. There is filtration technique which is done through dialysis machine. The third one is a combination technique. The combination technique means or the hybrid technique means where uh, the first stage centrifugation is done. The plasma is separated. The cells goes back to the patient. The plasma instead of being thrown out is further passed through a specific filters. Okay, ultra filters. Okay, so that filters once again removes the specific substances like antibodies, autoantibodies that needs to be removed will be removed and the remaining plasma goes back to the patient. Okay, so this technique is being used in most uh, premier centers. In our center also we try to use this where a combination of centrifugation with specific filters. Like you have filters like SLE filters are there. So those filters uh, will specifically remove those antibodies and remaining plasma goes back to the patient. Yes? The benefit is you need not throw the whole plasma, no? where a lot of other good substances to the body like albumin and coagulation factors, all those things are available. So you can give it back to the patient. You need not give plasma from some other patient uh, which can cause transfusion related reactions, all this stuff. So hybrid is gaining importance, but only the cost goes up. Okay. So uh, when it comes to types of plasma pharesis, you need to know autologous, exchange and donation. And then depending upon the machine, it can be centrifugation or filtration or combination technique. Centrifugation is by usually done by blood people. Filtration is usually done by dialysis machine, done by the nephrology predominantly. Uh, the combination is once again by the centrifugation and filtration combo is done by the uh, blood bank people. Okay, this is how it is being carried out in most centers. Okay, the machine which we use already I mentioned can be cell separator uh, like this. Okay, which is very costly. Okay, very costly cell separator machines or uh, hemodialysis machines. Okay. The cell separator machines have gone a huge uh, evolution. Okay, uh, the olden one you can see on the left side is a bulky machines. Nowadays you can see the machines are becoming sleeker, simpler. Okay, easy to use like that. You can see the Thermo Optia. Okay, which is uh, uh, easily usable. The Fenwall Amicus. These are also easily usable. Okay, user friendly machines. Okay, the circuit is like this in a centrifugal cell separation. How it is done as uh, uh, just follow my arrow. Okay, uh, that's where uh, the blood is being drained from the patient. It goes through a pump. From the pump, it goes to the centrifugal uh, pump, where the centrifugal pump rotates at certain speed. Uh, due to the speed of rotation, the plasma and the heavyweight cells are separated. Okay, if you want to use separate the plasma alone, the plasma which is a supernatant is taken away and it goes to a bag collected there and being thrown out, okay? The cells goes back to a separate bag mixed with the replacement fluids, okay? And then goes to a, another pump and then the heat, uh, heaters and then goes back to the patient, okay? So like that, the cells goes back and the plasma which is separated, the supernatant plasma separated by centrifugation goes to the collecting bag and then it's discarded. Okay. So hope this circuit is explanatory enough. Okay. This was centrifugation all known in MBPs. Okay. When you uh, centrifuge a blood, how uh, over a time the heavy cells are separated, uh, RBCs are down, the WBCs and the platters, uh, platelets in the buffy coat and then the plasma. This plasma can be taken away by a tube into a collecting bag and discarded, okay? If you use a dialysis machine done mainly by the nephrologist, you can use either a HD machine or you can use a CRRT machine. 
Uh, nowadays, you have the multi-filtrate machine from the Fresenius, which has been recently launched. Okay. So that is good for using on ECMO also. Okay. The other machines are a little bit tricky to use or cumbersome to use on ECMO machine. Okay. So you can use in where, where any of these machines can be used. Okay. So what is the circuit here like in a plasma pharesis uh, using single stage filtration technique by dialysis machine. Okay. Here the blood is taken from the patient. Okay, the venous blood. It goes to a pump, blood pump, and from there it goes to a filter. Okay, the filter filters the plasma alone. Okay, and the remaining plasma, less blood, which contains all the cells together, goes back to the patient. Okay, so goes back to the patient. Okay, the the plasma which is separated is discarded. And that has been replaced, replaced with the substitution fluid. Can you see this? Okay. So blood from the patient goes through a pump to create a small velocity that goes to a filter. The filter separates the plasma and discard it. Okay. The plasma is replaced with the substitution fluid. Once again, a pump pushes it back to the patient. Okay. So we call this filter as a plasma separator. Okay. It's a plasma separator. Now you have the next technique called double stage filtration. Okay, double stage filtration. Why we need this? Because in the previous technique, in the you separate the plasma and you throw the plasma out. There's a lot of waste. So plasma has a lot of good substances as well that also is being wasted. Now instead of wasting that separated plasma, that separated plasma goes through a second stage filter called the plasma component separator okay initial filter is called plasma separator the second one is called the plasma component separator okay the separated plasma goes through this filter there are various type of these plasma component separators are available nowadays okay from china and japan you can have too many for uh, uh, like um, good posture syndrome, you have a separate filter. For SLE, you have a separate filter. Okay, so you have separate, separate filters available. They are of, uh, a bit added cost is there. Okay, so what this filter sub separates, it, it separates specifically the antibody or the substance we want to remove. And the remaining plasma, if you follow the arrow, goes back to the patient it goes back to the patient okay so essentially we are discarding only the selected component from the plasma so remaining plasma goes to the patient so the discarded substances is essentially a waste product okay so this is dual stage cascade technique okay hope i am clear in this okay uh, something else you can add along with this plasma pharesis is CRRT. Okay, so many times this happens in critical care. Okay, so the previous pure plasma pharesis happens in, in uh, ward patients when they come for uh, certain neurological or certain hematological or uh, connective tissue disorders. Okay, here in uh, in ICU patients we see most of the patients are sick, so they are on uh, CRRT. As well as if they need a plasma pharesis, you can use this uh, combination technique. Okay, so where the blood from the patient comes, if needed, we add an anticoagulation. Not all critically ill patients needs anticoagulation. Okay, so some of the blood goes through the cell separator or it goes to the, uh, uh, the filter. Okay, so the filter filters the plasma. That plasma goes away and the remaining blood goes to the patient. Okay. Part of the blood goes to the hemodialysis machine. Okay. So this is a this is not in series component. This is parallel component. Okay. Parallel one. You have you can have a in series also. Instead of blood getting diverted into the filter, okay. So you can have a filter in series with the hemodialysis filter. So this filter instead of here will be a 
after the CRRT filter. Okay, hemodialysis filter. So the whole blood goes through the uh, filter, hemodialysis filter. Then it goes through the uh, plasma pheresis filter. And then it, the remaining component goes to the patient. The plasma is discarded. Okay, so that can also be done. Okay. So along with CRRT, plasma pheresis is done in most of the critically ill patients. Okay. <clears throat> so in uh, uh, in uh, condensation, the centrifugation and the filtration, we will see the uh, differences. Centrifugation uses centrifugal pump. It uses a cell separator machine, usually done by the blood bank people. Uh, the major difference is it can be used either through a central vein or even through a peripheral vein. If you use a peripheral vein, you need two peripheral veins in two cubital fossa, one for draining the blood and one for giving the blood back to the patient because it's a very slow flow, low flow, 50 ml per minute. So we can get away by using peripheral line. Okay. Uh, or instead of putting two peripheral line or sometimes it's very difficult to get in some patients you can put a central line with the dual uh, uh, lumens okay like what in dialysis line you do so you can so there is an option of doing central line or a peripheral line the flow is very low that's why the peripheral line is an optional possibility okay so here in centrifugation what in all blood components can be separated not only plasma so the whole blood goes, you can remove plasma, you can remove each and individual cells as well. So it can be a cell separator, it can be a plasma separator, okay? The separated plasma can go through further ultrafiltration or it can be discarded. What about filtration? Filtration is filter-based, single filter or dual stage filter. We use a CRRT or a dialysis machine. Here, the flow is more than 100 ml per minute. So you need a central line. Peripheral line will not work here. Okay. Okay. Once again, here it is single stage or dual stage. Okay. The multi-stage uh, is used specifically when you want to remove the specific pathogenic components alone. Then you use a multi-stage. The remaining plasma goes back to the patient. Okay. These filters are of two types. Again, it can be hollow fibers or parallel plate fibers. Hollow fibers are very gentle flow and is used in pediatrics. Okay, so filter means it is in hemodialysis machine done by nephrologist usually. It needs slightly higher flow, so it needs a central line. It can be single stage or multi stage. It can use hollow fibers or par parallel plate fibers. Okay, that's a common, uh, that's a, uh, what are the few differences between centrifugal and filtration techniques. Okay, now. How we incorporate that in the ECMO circuit? For that, we need to know the ECMO circuit. So quickly, let me go through the ECMO circuit. This is a VV ECMO circuit. So you venous blood is taken, goes through the pump sucks. Usually we use a centrifugal pump. The pump creates a negative pressure. So the flow is good here. And from the pump, it goes to the oxygenator, gets oxygenator, so then it goes to heat uh, cooler and uh, that oxygenated blood goes back to the vein in VV ECMO and it goes back to an artery, okay, uh, peripheral artery or a central artery in a VA ECMO, okay. Now we should know where we can connect the uh, plasma pheresis machine. Either it is a cell separator machine or it can be a dialysis machine where we can connect where we can take the blood, where we can return the blood. So that is a huge challenge, okay? Uh, you need to understand here the flow that is going through these ECMO circuits are usually more than 2.53 liters, yes? In a VB ECMO, we keep around 3 liters per minute. In a VA ECMO, we keep usually around 5 liters, 4 liters, 5 liters flow per minute, okay? But as I mentioned earlier, what is the flow that is required through a plasma pheresis machine is 50 to 150 ml. If you use a cell separator, you need just 50 ml per, per minute. Where is 3 liters, 3000 ml, and where is 50 ml? Okay, so that is the speed that is required in ECMO versus a plasma pheresis machine. This has a challenge when we connect a machine which uh, creates a challenge when we connect this 
um, what do you call the plasma pharesis machine on the pump. That's why we don't have one universal technique of connecting a uh, plasma pharesis machine in the ECMO circuit. There are various combinations available. Okay. I will show some pictures of that. Okay. So take this for instance. Okay. Here. Uh, blue is the drainage and uh, red is the written oxygenated blood. Okay, uh, this is the pump and this is the ox oxygenator. Okay, so here what we are doing is uh, this is the pre pump area, this is the post pump area. I hope my arrow is visible there. Okay. So this is a pre-pump area. This is a post-pump area. This is the post-oxygenator uh, circuit. Okay. Uh, the pressure in the pre-membrane is pre-pump is pre-pump pressure is usually negative. Yes, it is negative. The post-pump pressure is very high. It's like a systemic pressure. Okay. And the post-filter pressure is slightly low compared to the pre-filter pressure, okay. The challenge here is the centrifugal pump is a very strong pump, whereas the pump which is being used in the filtering or the plasma pharesis machines are what pumps? They are roller pumps, okay. They are roller pumps, okay. So now when you take blood from here, it is extremely difficult to take because the centrifugal pump is sucking the blood. Okay, so predominantly the blood will go into the pump. If you try to take blood from here into the filter, it is not very easy. Now you may think, why can't I take blood post pump? The post pump pressure is very high. Okay, so when the blood goes into the filter, the uh, machine starts alarming because you need to remember most of this dialysis machines or the plasma pharesis machines are used to the pressure, venous pressure coming from the patient, which is like 30, 40, 50. Okay. Whereas here they are exposed to a very high pressure. Okay. Usually you start, they, they start alarming. Okay. So that is a problem. Then what you can do, the pressure may have a slight drop post filter, post oxygenator, so can I take from there? Yes, we can take that. But then the problem is you can take the blood from here, like what is being shown in this circuit. Post oxygenator, you can take the blood, goes to the patient, goes to the filter, plasma pharesis machine here, whatever. You, you attach a, a CRRT machine here or you attach a cell separator here. You can go like this and then join the pre-pump. Okay. This is one of the technique. Okay, this also has a problem because uh, once again the pressure is not too low here. Two, you are recirculating this blood. You are unnecessarily taking the oxygenated blood and then recirculating into the non-oxygenated blood, which is coming going once again through the pump and then through the filter. So you are unnecessarily loading the uh, oxygenator here. Yes. But then this is one of the techniques so that the pressure may be slightly less and then it's easy to join the pre-pump circuit. Okay. There are various other ways are also doing. Okay. So this shows this circuit. This picture shows you various ways. Can you see the A, B, C is coming back to the patient. B and E is taking blood from the circuit. Okay. So uh, this is a ECMO circuit. Can you see from the femoral vein, the blood is being drawn negative pressure side. That's a negative pressure side. Yes, this is the centrifugal yeah. pump. Usually the negative pressure is something around minus 30, minus 20, minus 40. Usually we don't cross minus 50. Yes, from there, blood can be drawn, but drawing the blood is not very easy here because the hemofilter machine or the uh, centrifugal machines, they use only roller pumps, whereas we use a centrifugal pumps here. Okay, So somehow, little bit blood is diverted here, goes to the filter, okay, or the centrifugal machine, and then it can join 
we can either join the pre pump which is not uh, difficult which is easier there because the flow the pressure in this return circuit will be not very high so that it is easy to join the negative pressure okay it can join in the positive pressure side also but then it will be slightly difficult because the circuit pressure is very high yes so to go on join but whereas the uh, uh, blood pressure or the circuit pressure coming back from the centrifugal machine or hemodialysis machine is not very high okay so it is very difficult to push the blood into the positive pressure side okay the other thing is it can join the post oxygenator also but then you are diverting the blood from the venous side and the non oxygenated blood is joining the post oxygenator so we are we are reducing the saturation here yes so essentially we can take pre pump and you can join it pre pump after filtration or we can join post pump or you can join post filter each one has an advantage and a disadvantage okay you can also take post pump and return it pre pump or post pump or you can return it post oxygenator also so all these possibilities are there but everything has an advantage and a disadvantage okay so there is no one universal thing about it okay if you ask me what is commonly used my uh, at, uh, hospital is we usually remove post pump pass it through the filter or pass it through a cell separator and then return it pre pump so remove it post pump so like a d just focus on d okay it is post pump removal goes through the filter and then just follow the c okay so return it pre pump d c technique okay so remove post pump remove do plasma pharesis and return it pre pump is what we we use commonly but we also face some problem when we remove it post pump uh, our dialysis machine keeps on alarming okay so when this happens in some patient we try to reduce the centrifugal pump flow so that the post pump pressure is slightly reduced and the, our hemodialysis machine or the cell separator machine is able to take it okay that also we try to do but the problem is patient may start dropping his bp or saturation so that you have to keep it in mind okay sometimes what we do we take post oxygenator and return it pre pump okay yes we are putting lot of stress on the oxygenator but what else to do because if it is alarming here we try to put post oxygenator so that the pressure is slightly less here okay so we take it here post oxygenator and filter it and return it pre pump okay so hope i am clear so one is you need to understand uh, the first point is doing a plasma pharesis on a echo circuit is not easy it is tricky okay wherever you take wherever you return there are pluses and minuses you need to know that commonly what we use is removing post uh, pump and uh, returning returning it pre pump is what we use sometimes we have done post oxygenator removal and returning it pre pump understand this is what i use because depending upon what is the alarm we are getting okay sometimes uh, we try to reduce the centrifugal pump flow also uh, if the patient is able to tolerate that saturation and the pressure okay so this has various other circuits also i don't want to add more uh, more and more circuits okay so various circuits are available so that's about the machines and the circuit let's come on to the exact indications of plasma pharesis uh, there are various indications are there the neurological indications mainly gbs as myasthenia gravis you have a renal patients like sle patients or good posture syndrome hematological like uh, sickle cell crisis or ttp hus uh, dermatological conditions like pemphigus vulgaris you can have toxin removals okay some of the toxins especially i have done couple of patients where they came with a, a huge amount of calcium or multi dose poisoning 
coming with uh, multi dose poisoning coming with uh, hemodynamic instabilities and hypoxia we put them on ecmo and try to remove the toxins by using these filters also adsorption filters okay so we have done few of those things okay when it comes to uh, indications and categories we need to know the asfa categories asfa is the american society for uh, apheresis uh, the category is 1 2 3 and 4 Uh, why we need to know this is if some of the diseases comes in category one uh, means uh, they are first line therapies. Category one means uh, plasma pheresis is the first line therapy. Category two means if the plasma pheresis is a second line therapy, and uh, category three means the benefit is very doubtful, and the category four means it can be harmful. So don't do plasma pheresis in those patients. Okay. So we are looking at mainly category one, two, and three. Category one is uh, classically GBS patients. Uh, okay, uh, where we need to do uh, plasma pheresis or uh, myasthenic gravis patients where plasma pheresis are very useful. Okay, category two is where it can be second line therapies. Okay, category three is uh, may may not be useful like septic patients. We are now using. For various septic patient plasma pheresis, no removing the toxins or removing the cytokines, all those things. Okay, so that's about the category as far category one, two, three, and four. Okay, uh, what are the diseases that falls in uh, category one? Is as I told you, GBS, myasthenia, they all come under category one. That means they are first line therapies. Category two usually is ADEMs. Okay, where you try uh, plasma pheresis after giving high dose corticosteroid therapies okay 1 gram of corticosteroid is given then patient is not improving then you can try plasma pheresis okay like adm patients okay uh, category 3 is uh, classical septic multi organ failure patients where you have tried your resuscitation your appropriate antibiotics you have given your source control you have done your uh, uh, support for each organs if the patient is not improving and if your cytokine levels either your cytokine level or your endotoxin activity assay is uh, high you can try this okay category 4 like rheumatoid arthritis you you should not be using it because uh, they are harmful ineffective or harmful okay okay so in ecmo if you ask me in a patient in ecmo where we commonly use plasma pheresis is we have used in acute rejections acute organ rejections like recently we used in a lung rejection post lung transplant patient acute rejection to reduce the antibody loads on the antigen load we try to use uh, plasma pheresis okay on a ecmo patient because the patient is already on ecmo because the lung is failing because of the rejection and if you want the lung to improve we need to remove this um, antigen and antibodies okay uh, to us septic patients especially a ecmo patient if prolonged ecmo is going on there is a high risk of sepsis if they land up in sepsis and multi organ in spite of source control and appropriate antibiotic and resuscitation the patient is not improving we try to put this filters like toromycin filters or the cytokine cytosobs or the oxaris filters okay so we try to put that uh, along with the ecmo okay and some of these connective tissue disorder patients when they come with a severe lung damage they are hypoxic okay they can have severe cardiomyopathy as well so they may be on vv ecmo or a va ecmo if you want to reduce the uh, you want to uh, take the patient out from ecmo quickly we need to treat the uh, primary disease the primary disease in antibody antibody disease or autoimmune disease so you need to reduce the antigen antibody load so you need to put them on a plasma pheresis okay dual stage filtering you can do and try to remove the load of these antibodies okay so uh, severe connective tissue disorder with a lung or lung plus and heart problem when they need a ecmo basically uh, they are supportive only no when you put uh, uh, for lung and heart issues you basically you are supporting them but if you want to specifically treat them you need to remove the bad antibodies from the blood then you need to add a plasma pheresis along with an ecmo okay so these are the common condition i have used i do not know whether uh, any other center have used for any other specific reason 
Dr. Oza can add up if they have used in any other condition. These are the conditions I have used because uh, ECMO patient itself is not very high incident in that adding a plasma pharesis is not that common. Okay. So once you have decided to do an ECMO patient for a plasma pharesis, you need to have a SOP, standard operating procedure, you need to create in your ICU, okay. So this is just an example I have taken from uh, Portsmouth Hospital from NHS, okay. So you need to have, for every procedure, no? we used to have a SOP in our ICU like that, for a plasma exchange in an ECMO, you need to create a uh, SOP, so that the, our nurses, uh, our uh, junior doctors, and our uh, perfusionists, they are all well aware, the nephrology technicians, dialysis technicians are all aware of uh, what needs to be done, okay? So each one need not throw uh, their own ideas, okay? Because there are too many things happening. One side ECMO is going, one side ventilator is going, one side specific therapies are going, one side CRRT may go, and then you add a plasma pharesis. Too many things, too many connections, uh, too many persons involved. Unless you create your SOP and assign roles for each person, you do this, you do that, and uh, don't change uh, without informing others. So that should be there. You need to create your SOP. Okay. Then you need to follow the dose. How much should I dose? What do you mean by dose? Dose means uh, there are three things involved here. One is uh, uh, how much amount of plasma I should remove and how much I should replace. Okay. Okay. Two, uh, how frequently I have to do. Okay. And uh, three, how long I have to do. Okay. There are three things are there. Okay. Every day, each sitting, each sitting, how many, how much plasma I have to remove that decides the duration each sitting. Then second is how frequently I have to do the sitting. Should I do daily? Should I do alternate days? Should I do twice a week? Okay, or once a week in some chronic illnesses? Or should I do twice a day? Sometimes uh, bad uh, TTPHUS, we try to do twice a day also. So um, that is frequency. Then third is how long I have to do? For example, uh, alternate days for 10 days, that is five sittings, or alternate days for only a uh, few, for five, six days, only three sittings. Okay, so uh, how long I have to do? Okay, so what is the plasma exchange I have to do? How frequently I have to do? How long I have to do? All this is decides the dose. If you ask me what usually is done, the every sitting usually we do 1.5 to 2 times the plasma of the patient. Uh, what is the plasma volume of a patient is usually around 40% of their total blood volume is the uh, plasma, okay? Plasma volume. So you have to calculate from the weight. So how you calculate the weight then? So ideal body weight or the predicted body weight of the patient. Okay, so the predicted body weight of the patient, 40% uh, of that will give you the plasma volume. So usually 1.5 times the uh, plasma volume uh, will give you the uh, will give you the uh, amount of plasma that should be exchanged. Okay, so roughly. What is the blood volume per kg? Usually it is around 80 ml, 80 to 100 ml, no? 80 to 100 ml uh, per kg is the blood volume. 40% uh, of that is 40 ml per kg. Or uh, some people take 80 ml also. That becomes then 30 ml per kg, okay? So the plasma volume is essentially 30 to 40 ml per kg. And the predicted body weight, you, you know the formula how to have the predicted body weight is based on the height, okay? The formula is applied and the predicted body weight is calculated. Then the predicted plasma volume is calculated. Then 1.5 times minimum the plasma volume to be exchanged. Say if it is 40 ml per kg and the patient is around predicted body weight is 60 kg. Okay, that means how much uh, 6 liters, 40% of 6 liters is something around 2.5 liters. 1.5 times the 2.5 liters means uh, it's something around 4 liters. So something around 3.5 to 4 liters of plasma has to be exchanged in each sitting. Okay. Now, this sitting uh, has to be done 
twice a day or once a day or alternate days depending upon the disease some of the disease we do twice a day like ttphs some of the conditions neurological conditions we do every day like gbs some of the conditions we do alternate days okay initially we do uh, daily and then alternate days like myasthenia gravis we do that okay so it depends upon the disease where how frequently we do okay so all these things put together is called the dose okay so you have to sit with your uh, hematologist you need to sit with your neurologist depending upon uh, what is the condition of the patient and decide the dose so this this the dose has to be appropriately decided okay now once the dose is decided now uh, you need to replace no you have to replace the plasma how will i replace the plasma there are various options available okay okay the various options available one if you do a double filtering technique or a hybrid technique where you return predominantly most of the plasma back to the patient only the selected components are removed so you need not use any replacement fluid okay if you are removing significant plasma and you are discarding it then you need to replace the fluid that volume that you can replace either with the crystalline or with an albumin or with a fresh frozen plasma or combination of either one of these things three things okay so you can uh, various comp uh, composition we can combine all these things and give how you do that how you select that what we do is for example if the patient's coagulation function is absolutely normal okay his albumin level is absolutely normal and you are doing a plasma exchange first sitting we try to replace with crystalloids itself if the hemodynamics are not very bad okay so if the hemodynamics are not very bad okay if the hemodynamics are not very bad okay and uh, coagulation is okay and albumin levels are okay you can replace with crystalloids but if the patient has low albumin or if the patient has a clotting problem already you cannot use a crystalloid because you will be further diluting the albumin or clotting factors so if the albumin is already say 1.52 in the patient then you need to replace with albumin if the patient has a coagulation abnormality already then you have to replace with plasma okay sometimes you may if the coagulation inr is like 2 2.5 i may give some plasma and some crystalloid or some albumin okay a patient is having little bit hemodynamic instability with inr abnormality instead of giving crystalloids i give some amount of albumin and some amount of ff okay is it clear this is how you select some diseases some diseases very clearly we have to give ff only like classically ttp okay you cannot the patient hemodynamics may be normal the patient inr may be normal the patient's albumin may be normal but still you have to use only plasma because that alone will help the disease uh, control the disease okay so the replacement fluid whether to give replacement fluid how much to give should i give crystalloid albumin or ffp or can i combine and use it all depends upon the primary disease it depends upon the hemodynamics it depends upon the albumin level it depends upon the coagulation abnormality do you understand and what technique we use if you are returning most of the plasma you need not give plasma at all replacement fluid at all if you are discarding the whole removed plasma which is say every sitting you remove up to 3 uh, to 4 liters then obviously you have to replace with the fluid hope i am clear okay now Uh, you 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 decided the uh, plasma pheresis. You have selected the patient. This patient requires plasma pheresis. Okay. Uh, you have calculated the dose. You have decided on what replacement fluid to be given. Now you have to execute your plan. You have to execute your plan. So how are you going to do? So far only uh, the planning has been now done. Now you have to execute it. How do you execute it? You need to have an access line. Okay. and confirm the access line okay uh, the access line is usually central line you can use a peripheral line also if you are using a cell separator but that is very rarely used nowadays so you always go for a central line and confirm it with an x ray then set the machine whatever machine you are using a cell separator machine or you may use a, 
dialysis machine you select your circuits and the filters keep your replacement fluids crystalloids or uh, balanced crystalloids uh, colloids and blood products fill the dead space check the patient vitals check again the cbc's what is the platelet what is the hemoglobin what is the coagulation what is the electrolytes very important especially calcium okay so because most of these uh, patients who are on ecmo will have a possibility of hypocalcemia is there so we need to check the calcium and replace the calcium okay, okay. hello hello okay okay so we need to check all these things okay then once all these things are done stop your uh, plasma pheresis continuously monitor uh, the bp okay monitor the uh, uh, saturations because the pay we are doing in a ecmo patient so see whether by removing this fluid we are dropping the cardiac output or ecmo output that will cause drop in bp that can cause drop in saturation okay so monitor them closely what's happening to the saturation what's happening to the blood pressure okay uh, all those things what's happening then check your electrolytes calcium and if the ionized calcium is less than 1.1 or 1.2 replace calcium iv okay so do that usually the procedure takes 2 to 3 hours okay we remove usually 1.5 to 2 times the plasma volume which is usually 3 to 4 liters so we need to replace with either crystalloids or albumin or ffp or combination okay so we can either do daily alternate days or chronically okay so this is how it is done and we need to keep certain drugs essential drugs ready okay uh, anticoagulation heparin which will be already going on in uh, uh with the ecmo patient okay so usually i have pattern of 200 300 units you will be going you will be measuring your act activated clotting time or you will be measuring your pt ptt okay so no need to add any separate anticoagulation for uh, uh plasma pheresis okay because the flow is very slow see what happens here is the flow inside the ecmo circuit is very high so you may accept a low act okay so especially in bv ecmo the flow is around 3 liters v a ecmo usually 4 5 liters some of the v a ecmos we try to keep a low act also but that that can harm the uh, plasma pheresis because the plasma pheresis circuit is not a high flow circuit it's a low flow circuit so if possible try to keep a act at the higher level when you are using a plasma pheresis along with ecmo because you need to understand here there are two different circuits one circuit is having a higher flow other circuit is having a significantly low flow where is 3 liters 3000 ml and where is 50 ml or 150 ml so when the flow rate goes down the coagulation chances goes up yes in virtuous triad that's what happens no as the flow goes down the clotting goes up so we need to keep a higher act here so sometimes if the act is on the lower level then we may have to add more heparin is it clear okay so that's very important two is because you may uh, have allergies for the filter fibers or the ffps which we are giving or the albumin we are giving you need to uh, give anti histaminics we may have to give hydrocortisone sometimes these patients may develop uh, filter induced rigors so you have to give paracetamol to control that sometimes they will anxious so anxiolytics but then most of these echo may patients are already dilated so no need to do that you need to keep drugs essential for acls sudden any uh, hemodynamic derangement you need to keep all those drugs ready you need to give the blood and blood products you need to give the iv fluids ready so these are all the things we charge to be kept ready okay so do we have any complications yes by doing a plasma pheresis on a ecmo we may create more bleeding we because we are going to keep the act at the higher level so bleeding chances are high 
we are going to add more circuits more connections more handling so infection chances are there we are transfusing more blood and blood products so transfusion related complications especially in ecmo patient when the lung is bad transfusion related problems can make the lung stiffer and uh, weaning from ecmo may become a problem so we have to be careful so that's why uh, doing a, a centrifugation along with the filtration ultrafiltration and returning the plasma to the patient may be useful so that the filter you know need to use more transfusion okay uh they can also cause immune suppression so the patients may become more prone for infection so these are the complications that you may face you need to keep it in mind okay so in summary therapeutic plasma exchange or plasma pheresis is increasingly used in icus especially in transplant icus for acute rejection uh, we are using recently we used for a lung rejection patient various categories of indications as per as far is there category 1 and 2 please try to use it two broad types it can be centrifugal type or a filtration type or a combo type we started using the centrifugal and filtering technique uh, combo type recently ecmo usually filtration is used uh, because uh, most patients are on crrt as well so it is easy to just add one more filter there you can use a single filter or a dual filter technique okay uh, preparation of uh, preparations is very essential you need to prepare the patient you need to uh, keep the equipments you need to keep fluids and blood products and drugs keep your sop ready okay so preparation is very essential like any other sick patient don't jump to the procedure don't start the procedure just like that check go through the checklist keep the uh, equipments and the fluids drugs all those things ready okay start the therapy once you start the therapy uh, usually 1.5 to 2 times the plasma volume you need to sit and calculate the predicted body weight and the predicted plasma volume usually 2 to 3 hours sitting is done 5 uh, to 6 6 six sittings uh, daily or alternatively or chronically can be used with this i thank you all you guys for patiently listening to my talk and if there is any queries on plasma pheresis or ecmo i am ready to take it hello uh, should i share my screen sir yeah please Hello. Sir, I am not able to hear you, Dr. Venkat. Hello, Dr. Venkat. Go ahead, please go ahead. I am Dr. Santil here. Are you able yes, to hear me? Yeah, oh. I am able to hear you. Yeah. I am audible now. Yeah, I am. Yes. You are audible. You are audible. Okay, okay, okay. So, should we go to the next talk? Yes, sir. Sure. Okay, sir. Okay. So, I am sharing my screen now. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Are you able to see me? Yes, I can see you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Go ahead, please. Anything you want to discuss? Sir, your screen. Yes. Share, okay. sir. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. We can see you now. The screen is. So uh can we minimize this uh, photo sir yes 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 uh, so yes. that uh, it's visible to me okay thank you uh can i start yes sir you can start okay so good evening everybody i'll be talking about the renal replacement therapy because this is another form of extra corporeal therapy which we incorporate several times when we are having our ecmo run so why we need this this is needed when a patient develops acute kidney injury during the course of treatment so if we talk about the acute kidney injury in any patient in the intensive care unit the incidences ranges around 30 more than 30% in any icu patient and 
5% of these patients usually require some or the other form of renal replacement therapy. And once the renal th replacement therapy is initiated, in spite of this therapy, the mortality becomes as high as 60%. If you look at this data, in the patients with the ICU, if there was no ARF and no renal replacement therapy, the mortality was less than 10%. But the moment the renal replacement therapy was incorporated, the hospital ICU mortality and hospital mortality increased to 20 to 30 percent. And when those patients who required renal replacement therapy, the mortality goes as high as 60 percent. And this mortality actually increases with the increasing severity of acute kidney injury, which can be understood very well with this diagram. That when the creatinine levels are very high and they are requiring a renal replacement therapy, in those patients, the mortality is crossing beyond 60 percent. So how to define this? That's the most important. You know that how to define the acute kidney injury. So initially, it was the rifles criteria which is being used, which considers two things, GFR in the form of creatinine levels and urine output as a criteria. And as we say rifle, it means risk, injury, failure, loss, loss of real tissue, and end stage renal disease. So these three, first risk, injury, and failure, basically talks about the level of injury. And this is of our concern as an intensivist, our ECMO specialist. Once there is a loss of the renal tissues and end stage renal disease, basically these are the outcome measures which we talk about. So if we talk about the level of injury, if the creatinine level increases more than 25, if the GFR decreases more than 25% or there is a rise in creatinine more than 1.5 from the baseline value, our urine output is less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for more than six hours. Then, um, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible, sir. Okay. So, it is uh, more than six hours. This is considered as a risk for developing acute kidney injury. And this is when this persists for more than 12 hours, our creatine increases more than two times. It is the renal injury set in. And it leads to a renal failure when, gen when GFR further worsens and decreases more than 75 percent and creatinine increases to three times of the baseline value and there is a drop in urine output less than 0.3 ml per kg per hour for 24 hours and there is a anemia for the last 12 hours. So this has certain limitations then the next definition came is the acute kidney injury network and they also considered almost same thing on the value of syrup creatinine which they went for the that value of more than 24.6 millivolt per liter and when injury when it is increased in the two to three fold and failure when it is exceeding to the four milligram per deciliter and the similar criteria for the urine output at this call it as say one two and three so this is what exactly is the definition of acute kidney injury but the problem is they do not consider the age of the patient hemodynamic instability or requirement of pyrotropic support are other variables which are actually associated with the poor outcome in the acute kidney injury. If we talk about that, we all know that it's a life saving procedure. And these patients are at a very high risk of developing acute kidney injury and fluid outflow. Because what happens? Initially, patients are hemodynamically unstable and we push too much of fluid. And some of the therapies have shown that the incidence is as high as 75%. And renal replacement therapy usually required for the fluid balance and the metabolic control. And almost, almost 50% of the patient who actually develops AQI and few of them require renal replacement therapy during the ECMO. If you look at the prevalence of acute kidney injury the ECMO, uh, during the ECMO, not much of the data is available. But some neonatal registry for the non-cardiac neonatal patients also has a registry of almost 8,000 patients and has shown an incidence of 25%. However, with the increasing age, this incidence in the pediatric population goes to 60% and in adult it goes as high as 81%. But the problem is, most of these studies are from the single center and they have used the multiple definition and only also database where the different criteria has been used has compiled within the one platform. If we compare on the ECMO, these two definitions, acute kidney injury network by rifles and ECIN criteria, it holds good with the most of the uh, conditions and it ranges almost 81 to 85 percent in one of the post cardiotic patient group. So, 
how it develops. If we talk about a etiology, we know that it's uh, pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. So if we say pre-renal, it's basically a functional injury or stress due to the hypoperfusion. It's the most common reason of developing acute renal injury. And it is 70% of the community acquired, especially in our country, um, and 40% of the hospital acquired. Why I am saying this? Because in our country, when patient reaches, it's already hypotensive for a long time, not managed well in the primary centers, reaching to a tertiary care center, and they develop a high degree of acute kidney injury. And the severe hypoperfusion is the commonest cause of developing ischemic acute tubular necrosis. So the second one is the structural renal injury. It means there is an intrinsic injury to the um, patient leading to the acute kidney injury, and the incidence is as high as 40%. It can be ischemic and leading to a toxic tubular, acute uh, tubular injury in almost 90% of the patients. Obstructive injury, it's less than 5% and it can be, uh, it has to be bilateral or unilateral with a solitary kidney because if there is a renal injury, it has to be obstructive, it should be a bilateral. So why we are worried so much about the acute kidney injury? It leads to hyperkalemia and which is a predisposing uh, precursor for any kinds of malignant injury can lead to metabolic acidosis due to a decreased cardiac output and breaks the gut barrier for uh, function and leads to a sepsis. Hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, volume overload leading to pulmonary edema and hypertension, worsening the lung condition, delayed wound healing, bleeding tendency because of platelet dysfunction, increased risk of infection, encephalopathy due to the uremia, or stress ulcer leading to a GI hemorrhage, and moreover, it leads to a compromised state for the clinician to evaluate a patient because the, once the patient develops acute kidney injury, there's a contraindication to the contrast. Or there is a compromised management because we are restricted with so many drugs which are supposed to be a nephrotoxin. So risk factors, what are the risk factors? Some are the non murder fiber, like the old age, male patients, black brains, our patient is having some comorbid condition, already having pre-existing uh, kidney diseases, the diabetic, hypertensive, chronic um, liver disease, inflammatory bowel disease, congestive heart failure, peripheral arterial disease, the COPD or malignancy. So we can't modify this, but at least we should keep in mind when handling these patients that they are at a higher risk of developing acute kidney. Potentially modifiable factors which we can really handle. We can prevent hypoxemia, prevent anemia, we can handle sepsis quickly. We can aggressively manage the trauma patient. We can avoid the contrast or nephrotoxic drug. We avoid the volume uh, state uh, alteration in the volume status. That means we can prevent, uh, replace the volume, replenish this to prevent the volume depletion, or we can prevent the volume overload. And we see that we are not pushing too much of colloids, which are nephrotoxic. Some surgical patients, uh, some surgeries like a major cardiac surgery or even some major non-cardiac surgery, and especially the emergency procedure, these patients are at higher risk. Some environmental factors like a poor sanitation or poor control of parasite and vectors, and some healthcare, but poor healthcare budget and poor transportation also um, leads to a risk for developing acute kidney injury. If we talk about the pathophysiology of acute kidney injury during the ECMO, it's really a complex one. Patient, whenever prior to the ECMO, we can think of the condition um, prior to the ECMO. These patients are critically ill. They are uh, uh, having the hypoperfusion because of not maintaining the hemodynamic. They are having the poor perfusion state by low cardiac output. They are hypoxemic on the high ventilatory support, and lead, which leads to a high intrathoracic pressure and decreased venous return, further worsening the, um, the hemodynamics. There are systemic inflammatory responses because of the hemodynamic instability. There is a loss of autoregulation. And a lot of nephrotoxic drugs are actually uh, being pushed to the patient. And some patients uh, develop the fluid overload because we try to maintain the hemodynamics by administering the lot of fluid to these patients. And during the ECMO again, there are certain factors which actually leads to development of AKI. On one end, when we start ECMO, it improves the cardiac output, it improves the oxygenation, and it reduces the incidence of acute kidney injury, chances of acute kidney injury. But on the, on the other hand, certain variables from the ECMO itself, like if we talk about the hemodynamic factors, when we initiate a VA ECMO, it's a non falsified flow, which, uh, which really affects the particle and uh, medullary blood flow in the kidney and reduces the renal perfusion. 
we quickly try to reduce the radioactive drug to reduce the systemic plasma flow resistance to improve the um, cardiac output or our flow of our machine. It, again, sudden drop in the hemodynamics can worsen the situation. Certain hormonal factors like uh, uh, down regulation of the natural nature peptide or there is a dysregulation of renin angiotensin transversal system again predisposes to the acute kidney injury. ECMO, we all know that it in increases the systemic inflammatory response in the initial phases due to the blood air interface exposure to the non self membrane surface, means foreign circuit, and there is a stress to the blood during the ECMO. This all leads to a systemic inflammation and predisposes the kidney for the injury. Again, development of cardiorenal syndrome or the interaction of the lung and kidney, one organ as person that affects the second organ. Certain certain circuit related factor and operational factors like some form of embolism or there is a hemolysis or hyper development of the hypermyoglobinemia. This all leads to a worsening of renal function. But we should remember that a higher rifle stage at the onset of ECMO is associated with the increase in the mortality rate for all patients. Like if patient is non AKI, chances of mortality is 20%. And if it is the rifle I, uh, rifle F, the mortality goes as high as 100%. So quickly we'll see this ECMO, hemodynamic variables, hormonal variables, and pre treatment variables. So again, hypoperfusion, hypoxia, these all lead to acute uh, kidney injury and acute heart dysfunction. If this acute heart dysfunction leads to cardiorenal syndrome 1 and these biohemoral factor again leads to acute kidney injury. The hormonal variables, decreasing norepinephrine and epinephrine, decreased natural natural uretic peptide, these all leads to hemodynamic instability, decreased renal oxygen delivery and development of acute kidney injury. Hemodynamic variables, non pulsatile flow, vasopressor requirement, it leads to a decreased blood flow, decreased carcomaglory flow ratio, and ultimately decreased renal oxygen delivery. And these all contribute to a development of AK. How to evaluate these patients? So we all know that the physiological parameters like uh, looking at the blood pressure, cardiac output, central renal uh, pressures, renal blood flow, and renal vascular conductors, we all look at them. So the most important indicator is the urine out. We look for renal artery transit time uh, with the oximetry as so we can have a look. Biochemical parameters, we all know that the renal function, serum creatine, blood, uh, and urine creatine, urea nitrogen, electrolytes, GFR calculation, these all. But certain factors which actually will help us to make a diagnosis, such as looking at the free hemoglobin, plasma free myoglobin, hepatoglobin, plasma free iron, these all will give us a guide uh, for the cause of development of acute kidney injury. If there is a, because related with the circuit or with the ECMO, then possibly this can be a good help to diagnose. Imaging, yes, it will be helpful, but the biomarker so far has not uh, been studied much during the ECMO, but they have certainly ruled during the uh, development of acute injury, early diagnosis of acute kidney. Histological and immunohistological analysis usually has no, it should not, uh, is not done during the ECMO. These are the biomarkers we can see that that there's a uh, we look with the early we can angel uh, helps for early predictor for the development of acute uh, kidney injury similarly the serum sister cyst will also help us to diagnose our when it is indicated when we talk about the ECMO usually almost 50 percent of patient the indication first indication is the fluid overflow and the second important indication is prevention of fluid overflow so almost two thirds of the patient actually requires a renal replacement therapy for management of fluid overload. And remaining one third patient, they basically for the management of uremia are developed, uh, those who have developed acute kidney injury. So for meta correction of metabolic acidosis or for develop, uh, prevention uh, management of pulmonary edema, or they are unresponsive to the diuretics, are some because of some electrolyte disturbances such as hyperkalemia. Why it is beneficial? Basically, we can help for management of the severe lactic acidosis. We can avoid fluid or load and we can prevent a hypocalcemia. We establish a favorable volume status by improving the lung functions, by faster recovery of the left ventricular function because we take out the fluid, we prevent the distension of the LV so that there is a better diastolic compliance and contractility. Less myocardial, we can reduce the myocardial edema 
we are able to give administer a good amount of nutrition we can administer medication without uh, without uh, a restriction for the nephrotoxic drugs we can administer the blood and product blood and product and we can handle the systemic inflammatory response which is induced by the acne so there are certain papers which have shown that there is a fluid overload is associated with the high mortality we can see here when at the uh, time of initiation the fluid overload was less than 10% so patients outcome was much much better when we talk about when the initiation uh, at the time of initiation fluid overload was more than 10% when we divided this group into two at the discontinuation of crrt when the fluid overload was less than 10% survival was still better but when it was less more than 10% of the fluid overload the survival was very poor so what is the principle of management of acute kidney injury during that the most important the hemodynamic optimization so you at the moment you try to optimize the hemodynamics which is the primary goal on the echo then possibly um, acute kidney injury starts recovering we restore the intravascular volume we avoid and stop the nephrotoxic drug we prevent and management of the sepsis if it has developed and we do the fluid management as for the phase of resuscitation phase of the um, patient if it's a resuscitation phase don't mind to give too much of fluid administer fluid to maintain the hemodynamics but once the patient is op has optimization of the hemodynamics during the optimization phase restrict the fluid during the stabilization phase you further restrict the fluid and just administer whatever fluid is required for the body and when there is a resuscitation phase when patient has optimized stable so we look for the organ um, perfusion in stabilization and now we try to take out the fluid from the body but in, in spite of all these effort if patient doesn't show improvement then we um uh, we should initiate the renal replacement therapy so what option we have the, for the renal replacement therapy we can have the continuous renal replacement therapy when we say continuous by definition when a therapy is continued for more than 24 hours it is called as continuous therapy so it can be a continuous renal replacement therapy or even peritoneal dialysis because peritoneal dialysis usually continued for 40 to 72 hours if not complicated and there are can be intermittent therapy in the form of intermittent hemodialysis or sled so these are the major renal replacement therapy what we have in the intermittent therapy we can have intermittent hemodialysis or isolated ultrafiltration in the hybrid therapy because it's in between the continuous therapy and intermittent therapy we can have sled or sled f is uh, uh, for the filtration and then we can have the continuous therapy in the form of cvvh continuous hemovenous hemofiltration continuous hemovenous hemodialysis hemovenous hemofiltration and slow continuous ultrafiltration so how these are different you can see in this diagram you can see a patient is on sled a patient is on daily hemodialysis and on cvv if you look at this this uh, thing you can see that this is the for cvv and that uremic control is a very uniform and gradually dropping but if you look at the um, hemodialysis and sled it is the moment you do it it comes down the moment next 24 hour it again goes up so uremic control is not uniform when we talk about the hemodialysis or sled similarly for the large uh, molecule clearance it is better with the use of continuous uh, continuous therapies um, of the renal replacement so when and how to start the timing so far we don't know the exact time but what is said that early initiation especially for preventing or managing the fluid overload is associated with a good outcome patient where we delay the therapy have the higher mortality and the selection of modality depends on what therapy is for so when to initiate the crrt as per the cadigo guideline they say initiate renal replacement therapy emergently when a life threatening changes in the electrolyte and acid base balance experiment and the second point says consider the broader clinical context the presence of um, this can be modified with rrt and trend of laboratory tests rather than single blood urea nitrogen and creatine value alone so if there is a life threatening situation fluid overload electrolyte or acid base balances imbalances the crrt rrt should be initiated immediately but if there is a increasing rising trend and patient is having urine output then possibly we can think of uh, waiting for some time this therapy intermittent hemodialysis or crrt 
So the outcome wise, there is insufficient evidence to establish that CRRT has some superiority over the other form of therapy in the form of intermittent hemodialysis therapy. Similarly, no mortality difference between the therapy. But yes, the CRRT has shown less chances of development of the chronic renal failure in the patients who have been treated with the CRRT in the intensive care. But my question is, can we do other modalities uh, when a patient is hemodynamically unstable or a patient is on a high anotropic support or we need really a good fluid control? We do a, a intermittent hemodialysis for four hours and we take out one liter of fluid. Is it, is it really going to help us? No. So if we compare these therapies, intermittent hemodialysis, it can be connected nicely with the ECMO. It reduces the downtime, lowers the cost of, uh, low, uh, is the cheaper one. But the problem is you can't do it in the hemodynamically unstable patient. There can be a risk of disequilibrium syndrome and potential risk of cerebral edema, and it is more complex and demanding. If we talk about the SLED, again, it can be connected. Downtime is less, and they are, but they are again associated with the hypotension and more complex. CRRT, it can be connected. It does not cause disequilibrium syndrome. It can give potentially allow blood purification therapies for systemic inflammation. Yes, patient is immobilized. Increased risk of hypothermia and the cost is high. But these points, actually patient is already on ECMO. It's a costly therapy. Patient is already immobilized. And hypothermia, we maintain the temperature when our patient is on ECMO. So actually the point, these points um, does not make any difference if we use the CRRT in this patient. PD should be restricted for those uh, patients uh, uh, for the pediatric population because it is always beneficial in the hemodynamically unstable patients. It's technically very simple and it's just very cheap, but there is always a risk of bleeding because your patient is on heparin and if you try for PD and you injure some vessel uh, while going through, then possibly it can be a disaster. Intermediate therapies, if we talk, they are cheaper, flexible time allows for mobility, but we don't need mobility when a patient is on ECMO. There's a rapid correction of fluid load, which can be a problem during ECMO. Rapid removal of dialyzable drugs, Rapid correction of acidosis and graphite, we need it to be smooth and continuous and minimize the anticoagulant exposure, but the patient is already on anticoagulant. But the problem is almost 30 to 60 percent patients, they develop hypotension and developing this hypotension actually further worsens the renal injury and it can lead to a gut and coronary ischemia. And some patients can develop separate kidney mass. Continuous therapy, it can have a better hemodynamic stability, but is yet to prove that... Sorry, get to prove that they have the better renal recovery. Stable volume control, yes. Stable and predictive control of blood chemistry, intracranial pressure is stable, and we can have certain cytokines over low mortality benefit is still challenged. The problem is anticoagulant requirement, which we already giving for the patients who is on ECMO. Potential for filter clotting, it can always be changed, expensive, Patient ECMO itself is an expensive therapy and immobility and transport issues not a problem when a patient is on ECMO. So use continuous or intermittent. I'm not saying that one therapy is superior to another, but it should be done in a positive manner. When a patient is unstable, it is best to do a continuous therapy. And once the patient has been stabilized, we can choose the modality according to the requirement and it can be done the SLED or intermittent therapy. Then comes the dose. How much therapy do we I will not go in detail of this for the constraint of time, but when we talk about the um, dialytic therapy in the form of intermittent or sled, we talk about KT upon G, which is usually 2.4, but when we talk about the CRRT, we talk in terms of influent dose, which is usually kept around 35 ml per kg per hour. Because it is said the best outcome when the um, when the effluent volume, effluent uh, dose is more than 30 ml per kg per hour. So, what are the different modes of uh, renal replacement, uh, continuous renal replacement therapy? It can be stop, it can be CVBS, CVBSD, and CVBSD. I have put A because those who are from the perfusion side can understand very well. During the cardiopulmonary bypass, we can have the arterial venous uh, filter in between. So this stuff is only takes out the water. It has the high flux membrane. It's a slow continuous ultrafiltration. 
you set the blood flow rate between 50 to 200 and you can take out the volume to 8 ml per minute. CBTS continuous veno hemofiltration. It basically uses the convective clearance and um, you can take out the volume as well as a small uh, to uh, solute with this. You can do a replacement. Basically, when we say CBTS, we replace the fluid. We can do it pre or post filter. The blood flow can be 50 to 200 and we can go as high as 10 to 60 ml per minute. CVVSD is nothing but the actual dialysis, which uses the diffusive solute clearance and take out all these moderate molecules. And again, the dialysis flow can be kept between 50 to 60 ml per minute and we can have ultra filtration rate range from 1 to 8 ml. CVVSD means continuous venovenous humidor filtration. Here you can see that there are two bags. One is dialysate and other is the replacement solution. And this is the filter and it's the pump and it is the ultra filtration. So it's basically a high flux membrane which uses both the diffusive and convective therapy. And uh, you can do a both dialysate and replacement. It is the, for, uh, uh, for the patient where you need a rapid correction for metabolic, uh, metabolic uh, acidosis and you want to do dialyze, then possibly this is the best therapy. How to do? I will not go in detail, but because it will be a separate lecture, but quickly it can be performed to a, a venous access separately, independent from the ECMO circuit. If there can be inline new filter, or it can include a CRRT machine actually to the ECMO circuit. This is how it's a, you can see in this diagram, it is a separate filter, patient is on DV ECMO and separately, you can see that uh, CRRT is in progress. Inline filter, you attach the filter, you can see that this is the ECMO circuit, this is the ECMO circuit, it's the pump, and you can attach filter in me. And if you add a dialysate in this, it becomes CVVSD. And if you attach the replacement to this, you can do a CVVSD therapy. And if you don't attach both these, you can just use it as stuff. This is how the CRT machine has been connected. You can see this, this is the ECMO circuit. This is the ECMO circuit, the one circuit, and you have connected the second circuit CRT device with this. So these two extra corporal circuits can be connected together. The recovery, when we combine ECMO with the CRRT, though it has not been studied much, but the results are encouraging. To conclude, patients who are receiving either VA or VV ECMO are at a high risk of developing acute kidney injury and fluid overload. Cumulative fluid um, overload is independently associated with the high mortality, poor oxygenation, and long hospitalization and ICU stay. The pathology is basically multifactorial and monitoring renal function and appropriate measure must be taken to do the hemodynamic stabilization and we must avoid the nephrotoxic drug. And almost 50% patient on ECMO who developed AKI may require some form of renal replacement therapy. We still need to learn more that when to start, what is right time and how much dose will really be a good when a patient is on Thank you very much. If you have any question, and I invite all of you to attend this two days workshop, which we are conducting at our DMCH Ludhiana on 24th and 25th of August. Um, you can contact us uh, for this. Thank you very much. If you have any question. Thank you, Vivek. It was a very good lecture. And uh, any questions, please? Any questions? No, thank you, uh, Please come back again, madam. Sorry, I could not hear you. Hello. Hello. Ah, sir, this is Ramesh. Hello. Yeah, yeah, Ramesh. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, sir, like uh, it's, it's said that with the pulsatility uh, has a role in maintaining renal blood flow and, uh, yeah. and the further uh, decreasing the incidence of AK. Uh, like, what do you? What's your uh, take on that, sir? Like, is that uh, true? Like, or even with the we are doing. Like when we do uh, yes. IABP plus uh, ECMO, then it uh, uh, some, somewhat gives some pulsatile nature to the circulation. And uh, 
uh, has there been a decrease in cases of uh, AKI with IABP plus ECMO versus only ECMO alone, or uh, what's your take and experience on that? Sir? That's a very good question, what you asked. Basically, what happens? It is on one way it is helping because the moment you start ECMO, there is improvement in the cardiac output. So it improves the actually real perfusion, but it does not maintain the corticomedullary blood flow when there is a non-pulsatility. Most of the time, and that is not only a problem to the kidney, it is basically a problem to um, uh, heart as well. If you don't maintain the pulsatility in those conditions, you will have the risk of LV distension and you will have a risk of uh, clot formation in the LV itself. So you should always try to maintain the um, uh, pulsatility by all means. Whether you are using a medicine or you are using IBP or whatever method you are following or you are doing a decompression if it, nothing is working. But for IABP only for maintaining renal perfusion, possibly I will not uh, go for it. The reason is IABP itself, the position of IABP can alter the renal blood flow itself. So that will be another issue and you are putting another modality just to improve the renal perfusion. So in that condition, possibly just maintaining a good hemodynamics gradually will start improving the uh, will start improving the outcome um, uh, acute kidney injury and i will i would love to manage this acute kidney injury if it develops in due course of vfo with a shorter therapy with a real replacement therapy because um, that is a transient one that will not stay for a long time the moment you improve the cardiac function you may be, uh, reduce the vasopressors and do other uh, measures to improve the hemodynamics then this uh, acute kidney injury improves of itself The main thing you will say is the perfusion to the perfusion pressure to the uh, kidneys from the heart. That, will, that is enough to decrease the load and subsequent uh, improve the renal function. Right, sir? See, as we say that our target pressures, say if the systolic pressure should be less than 95, so around 70 to 95 systolic, and we are maintaining a, a pulse pressure around more than 10, around 14, 15, or 18, then possibly the risk becomes lesser. But definitely there is a risk. But maintaining a slightly higher perfusion pressure, say seven, um, uh, uh, maintaining a systolic pressure on ECMO around 80, probably will be maintain a good perfusion to the kidney as well. But there is no such a study per se, particularly in this, that on ECMO, how much exactly will be this. But what we get with our experience, this is what I'm discussing. Okay, thank you, sir.